Lord, we thank you for uh, this evening and uh, getting to study your word together. Yes. We welcome your spirit to be with us. And uh, Lord, here in this room, as well as for everyone who will watch from home, we pray that you would come and minister to them, Lord, and uh, give us all understanding. We love you. We praise you. We ask this of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. All right. Well, last week we, uh, we covered about five different terms, uh, four different terms. Uh, we looked at terms that emphasize the results of sin. And we, so we went through how uh, sin can cause us to be agitated or restless. Sin can cause us uh, to uh, be evil or uh, bad. It can cause us to feel guilt and be guilty. And it can cause trouble in our life. So as you sow, you will reap. If you sow trouble, you're going to reap trouble. And so we went through all those in much more detail, finishing up for uh, or use, spending an entire hour on those. Tonight, uh, I don't have any verses written down because we're going to, uh, we will be looking up a few, but it'll be uh, a little bit different. We're going to transition, and so uh, we're still in sin, and there's a lot still to cover in sin, but we're going to look at the essential nature of sin, and it's a good question to ask. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of what uh, the writer of our theology book is saying because he puts it so well, and then we can uh, spend some time talking about it. Um, so... He starts off and says, We have seen that there is a wide variety of terms for sin. Over the last five weeks, we've been looking at all these terms for sin, each emphasizing a somewhat different aspect. But it is possible, uh, but is it possible in the midst of this bewildering variety to formulate some comprehensive definition of sin, uh, to identify the essence of sin? So what he's asking is, with having looked at just pages and pages of uh, terms that emphasize the character of sin and uh, terms that emphasize the causes of sin, all these different terms that we've looked at about sin, is it possible to come down to what the essence of sin is, to, to be able to define what sin is? He says, we have seen that sins are uh, variously characterized in the Bible as unbelief, rebellion, uh, perversity or iniquity, um, missing the mark. So when you've got all these different definitions, everything from unbelief to rebellion to perversity uh, to, to missing the mark, what is sin? What is the essence of sin? If we were to try to define it as one thing that, that still didn't take away from all the different aspects of what sin is, uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight is what is the essence of sin? A common element running through all of these varied ways of characterizing sin is the idea that the sinner has failed to fulfill God's law. There are various ways in which we fail to meet His standard of righteousness. We may go beyond the limits imposed or transgress, which we talked about, one of our words. We may simply fall short of the standard set or not do at all what God commands and expects. Or we may do the right thing, but for a wrong reason, thus fulfilling the letter of the law, but not its spirit. Can you see how sin, uh, sometimes I, we, we think of sin and we, I think we, uh, we think of it so simply, and then over the last five weeks or so, we have really broke down how many different ways we can sin. That we can sin by not believing God. We can be doing the right thing, all the right things in front of all the right eyes, but our heart is wrong. Our motives are wrong. We, we can be feeding the poor, but doing it so everybody will talk good about us, right? Which makes our feeding the poor a sinful thing because of the attitude. Now, does God get, uh, does, does he, uh, he says even if a person preaches for their own glory and they win someone to Christ, they're still good coming out of it. Don't get me wrong. Feeding poor people, praise God, there's still good coming out of it. Jesus, Jesus even says, hey, if they're, if they're not against us, they're for us. The word's going out. But for you as an individual who's out there sharing the gospel so you can go and boast to your friends, you've received your reward in full. In fact, you, you are a sinner because of the motivation of your heart, that you're motivated. Can you imagine 
being motivated to share the gospel with people, but your motivation to go out every day and try to win souls is that you're trying to hit a certain number or you want to be able to outdo other people. It's competitive or it's about everybody talking about what a soul winner you are. Do you understand that that's, that's what makes that sin? Even winning people to Christ can be sin when it's done with the wrong motive. So sin is something that has so many different facets to it. Uh, unbelief, doubt, just flat rebellion against God. You know, uh, iniquity where we literally deny what God says and say what he says is true. What I say is true. There's, there's so many layers and levels. There's little white lies just stretching the truth a little bit. There's sin that is done and we're ignorant of it. There's even very lightweight sin that we don't even know we're sinning and we're sinning. No one ever told us that law or that command and we've been doing it. A man out there who's been told all of his life that it's okay to look but don't touch. He can lust with his eyes as long as he doesn't do anything physically. And if he's been taught that God's okay with that, he's enjoying himself, lusting, but has no idea that God is saying, you're a sinner. You can't do that until the law comes and points out that, right? So that's what we're, we're kind of uh, beginning to uh, delve into here. All these various ways in which uh, we can fail to meet that standard of righteousness, everything from the motive in our heart to our outright actions. We can go beyond the limits of the law. Um, and, and so we transgress. We can add to the law and we transgress. We sin against God. He goes on and says in the Old Testament, sin is to a large extent a matter of external actions or outward lack of conformity to the requirements of God to a large extent. Inward thoughts and motives are not completely ignored, though, in the Old Testament. He does deal with the heart. Last week, I used Jeremy as an example, and, uh, and he's not here tonight. I ran him off, didn't I? <laughs> I used Jeremy as an example, and my example was, because we have a few of you that weren't here last week. Uh, well, back there's four of you that weren't here last week, and y'all were. So the whole room, Arlene... And Allison and I were the only ones here last week. So let me retell my story. Tried. You tried. <laughs> so, my <laughs> so my example was this. I'm out chopping wood, right? Me and Jeremy are out chopping wood. And we're buddies, right? My axe he head flies off, hits him in the skull, and he drops dead. All right? Now, according to the Old Testament law, if I go back and I say... I was chopping wood, and the axe head flew off, and it, and, it, and it killed Jeremy. I am guilty of what we would call manslaughter. It was not intentional. I didn't have hate in my heart. But in the Old Testament, it describes very specifically in the definition that if people knew that I didn't like Jeremy, we didn't get along, and we were out chopping wood together, and he comes up dead... Oh no, they're going to say, we know you hated him. And so now it's a whole other level. Now it's eye for eye. Now it's a death sentence for me. It's not a death sentence. If it, that it would not be a death sentence for me if my heart was innocent. So you see, even in the Old Testament, most of the things we see are outward. Here comes the brother I knocked off in a story. He'll be welcome. In. If I... If I, if I do it with anger in my heart, you see what Jesus says was not a new thing. He's saying what the law said, but he's bringing it out to them. He talks about lusting uh, with the, the eye is committing adultery in the heart. And he says hating, hating someone in your heart is committing murder in your heart, right? Come on in, Jeremy. Most of the folks weren't here last week. So I had to retell the story. Because. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 nah. <laughs> That's right. So even in the Old Testament, we have these uh, places where um, motives are not 
ignored. It's in the law. It's just maybe not as predominant. But when we get into the New Testament, motive is spoken about a lot more. Jesus brings the motive of the heart to the forefront. And I think the reason that he does it, well, let me ask you first. Why do you think Jesus would make it even harder on us and say, it's really murder if you hate somebody in your heart? It's really adultery if you lust in your heart. Why would he make it even harder than the law already was? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say this for the people who will watch later. Jeremy, uh, Jerry, sorry. Jerry said it's because we're under grace now. And that is exactly uh, because Jesus was making that way uh, of grace. He needed us to know that we were sinners. And so as you can see in the scriptures, there's young men, rich men who come up and say, I've kept the whole law. There were people walking around in Jesus' times who believed with really all their heart that they had kept the whole law. And they're asking Jesus, how do I go to heaven? He says, keep the whole law. Well, I keep all of it. And so what he's doing is he's saying, no, you need to understand there's parts. And, and notice, I just got through telling you in Deuteronomy is where that's at, where it talks about the motive behind what you do and it ramps it from manslaughter to full-blown murder and the sentence is different based on the motivation behind what you do and so jesus takes it and makes it even more difficult for us to think we can work our way into heaven by obeying the law he just literally yeah he makes it impossible for us to get into heaven you know and 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 then we got the holy spirit coming and convicting and bringing about uh what we're doing inside our heart, in our minds, behind closed doors when nobody's watching. And we, what he needed is for us to recognize we're sinners. Because as long as I think I can work my way into heaven, I don't need Jesus. And I'm going to miss heaven. Because Jesus knows I need his blood. I need his grace. He knows I must have his grace. And I must come to a place of recognizing that I'm hopeless without him. As long as I think I can do it myself, I'm in real bad trouble. I'm going to miss heaven. It's and so, the word that we spend a lot of time in this work, too, because yeah. uh, I have found things that I thought were okay. Yeah. And the Bible says clearly that you test it. Exactly. It's not okay. Yes. We can, be, uh, we can be going through being Christians, going to church, and not know that we're in sin. Jerry was saying that it's important we read the Bible because sins can be pointed out to us. And... Um, that, that we didn't even see. And I know that's happened to me a lot of times as well, Jerry. I, things that I just hadn't really thought about that, or I didn't see it in myself. I didn't see uh, my anger or my gossiping, or I didn't see my pride, or I didn't, I didn't even notice I was being greedy. I, I didn't notice those things. And when I'm reading the Word, He starts shining light. The Word of God is a, a lamp and it's a light, and it's a mirror in James, and it shows a true reflection. You know, I've, I've said that in some sermons in the past. Uh, who has a mirror that always shows you a picture of the way you want yourself to look? Mirrors tell the truth, don't they? You, you look at a mirror, and if you've got hair sticking up, it isn't going to comb it down for you so you feel better about yourself. A mirror is going to show you every wrinkle you got, everything. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they tell the truth as long as they're straight, right? So. Wow. And so there were a lot of things I learned growing up that was like, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And then when you start branching out and reading the New Testament, you're like, oh, yeah. okay. So I yeah. can do some of these things. Yeah. So yeah. It's, really it's funny. Yeah. Legalism tends to go that way. And then there's folks who only preach out of the New Testament and don't and say the Old Testament's the old thing. We don't read that. There's churches that go both ways, and it, the Bible is all God's word. It's all God breathed. It's all useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And the thing that we've got to remember for those who throw out the Old Testament is how did the first church share the gospel? What Bible, what text did they use to share the good news about Jesus Christ? They were taking the Old Testament text, and they were taking from that the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because it tells about him. And they were going out and sharing what Isaiah said, what Micah said, what Malachi said, what Daniel said, what Moses said, what David said. That the Psalms, the Proverbs, they're they're saying, look, he's he, this is him, this is him. He fulfilled all these things. In fact, the writings that we have that we call the New Testament is just the first century church writing down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit what they found in the Old Testament and saying, this is the one who came. We're going to write this down so you all can read it, but we're pulling from this Old Testament. We're showing you how it's fulfilled in Jesus. That's all that was. So to throw out the Old Testament is so messed up, and to throw out the New Testament, you're throwing the gospel out. <laughs> it's like, not good, not good. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they do. They all go together. It's all the Word of God. So, All right. Let me pick back up with uh, reading here because I, I want to share with you. Uh, we're, we're going to get uh, to a, a good definition. We're going to look at three different ones. Um, he says, uh, so Jesus condemned anger and lust as vehemently as he did murder and adultery. In Matthew 5, we, and we've been talking about those verses, he also condemned outwardly good acts done primarily out of a desire to obtain the approval of humans. Good acts that were primarily done out of a desire to get approval from other people. He condemns that, doesn't he? He says that if you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, right? He says if you fast, don't do it to be seen by everybody like the Pharisees and Sadducees do, right? He talks about, he teaches us that that is sin when we fast and announce it. When we pray and announce it on street corners. Is it wrong to pray in public? No. It's, it's prayer, it's the heart that matters. Is it wrong if we as a church all decide to fast together and we all know each other's fasting? Well, someone could take that verse and say, well, nobody should know if you're fasting ever. Well, that's not what Jesus is teaching. There's whole nations get called to fast and pray. Israel many, many times is called to pray and fast as a nation and they announce it and they all do it together. That's not the issue. The issue is a heart matter. You sin when you're fasting, when you fast for the glory and the accolades of men. And when you give money to the church, to God, to the poor. It should not be announced. Now, when you give at the church, there's going to be somebody in this church that counts it. There's different tellers that rotate and they count. And somebody will see your check on occasion, but they don't know what you give every week. And there's one person who puts it all into the computer. So you'll get a little slip at the end of the year that lets you know how much you gave so you can report it to the IRS. Somebody's going to know. But it's not sin for them to know it's sin if you do it to announce it, right? So we've got a lot of cases where God, uh, Jesus really condemns uh, us doing things outwardly that are good, but doing them from a heart that wants uh, that glory. He says, yet sin is not merely wrong acts and thoughts, but sinfulness as well, as, uh, as well an inherent inner disposition inclining us to wrong acts and thoughts. So he's saying it comes from within. It's not just the outward action. In fact, do you remember that place where Jesus says that it's not what a person puts into their mouth that causes them to be sinners? It's what comes out of the heart and out of the mouth that makes them sinners. He says what he's talking to them about is the food they eat. He's saying, you know, you, you can eat some meat. Maybe it was offered to an idol. Maybe you don't even know. It's not sin what goes in. He said, that goes into your body and out of your body. But he said, what comes out of your heart, that's what you got to watch out for. Yeah, that's what defiles a person. It's what comes out of their heart. And so, that, again, that's what he's talking about here is the motivation, the things that stir up. So it's not the wrong acts or thoughts, but it's the sinfulness that is inherent, the inner disposition that desires to sin. So we are not simply sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We have a heart, right? So it's not that I'm, I'm perfect and fine. Oh, shoot, I said a cuss word, now I'm a sinner. No, 
You're born a sinner. You got a sinful heart. You were a sinner from conception. And so you're going to sin. You sin because you are a sinner. That's what you are. You're a sinner in need of a Savior, right? Instead of thinking that we are, uh, all mankind is good, but, oh, now I'm a sinner because I messed up. That's not the biblical definition. We, we are born sinners, totally depraved in our sin. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, the, probably one of the simplest things, just for the sake of everybody in the room today, is um, Paul said, I die daily. I have to die to that sinful nature every day. So it doesn't weaken what Christ did for us, but it means that every day I have to uh, reckon myself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that's the language that Paul speaks in. He, he talks about the struggle. He talks about the battle. He says we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Rather, we have one who has been test, tempted in every way, yet he was without sin. He understands. He wants us to come to him when we have uh, trouble and sin. And, and you got First John 1, 9, that verse we've all memorized, right? That if we... Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that word confess is not a one-time confess. The verb there is an ongoing verb. It means if we continue to come to Him and confess, He continues to forgive, which shows it's not over the day that we're born again. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. That's hard when... Yeah. I've had a man... I had a man years ago... Of course, when you're a really young pastor in your 20s, everybody wants to tell you how you're wrong and how you should be doing it. And a long time ago, I had a guy come to me. He was close to being my dad's age. And he told me that once you're born again, you do not sin anymore. You should not sin. You don't. And I was like, and he goes, I don't sin anymore. And I was like, it's hard to argue with a man and say, yes, you do. So I just said, okay, well. I don't think that's what the scripture teaches and I don't know anybody that hasn't committed a sin and usually uh, when you think you haven't, you're sinning right there. <laughs> we're going to talk about that and I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, that very thing. But that man was adamant to the day that he finally gave up on me, couldn't convert me and he, uh, and he, and he really got that. There's a great theologian in history that is well known for many amazing things, you know, anointing, great preaching. The founder of uh, Methodism, John Wesley, uh, him and his brother Charles believed that it was possible. They didn't say that everybody reached it when you got saved, but they, they felt that it was possible that you could grow in the Lord to a level that you became sinless. And that's where he was getting this from, was that idea. He had come out of some of that. And um, I think that we have a lot of other scriptures, like Paul, I, I have to die daily to the things that want to stir up him in. We're going to hit a little bit more on that in just a second when we talk about the flesh. But he goes on and he says, we offer then this definition. Sin is any lack of conformity, active or passive, to the moral law of God. This may be a matter of act, of thought, or of inner disposition or state. Sin is failure to live up to what God expects of us in act, thought, and being. We must still ask at this point, however, whether there is one basic principle of sin, one underlying factor that characterizes all of sin in its manifold varieties. Several suggestions have been made. The first one, they title sensuality. But we use the word sensuality and generally think of it only in a sexual term. But sensuality really is things that have to do with the flesh senses. Try to think of it that way. Because it's, it's not narrowing it down to sin being only things that have to do with sex. It's saying things that have to do with the uh, the sinful nature. The flesh is what it's talking about. Since what we Our five senses have to do with our flesh, our body, right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think five fetal is something that I Emotion, yeah, we can be carried by our emotions instead of the truth of God's word, yeah. 
and it, it's very deceptive, isn't it? And sometimes we, we believe our emotions are so strong. Yeah, we think it's God's voice. And that's why it's so important that God's word remain that standard that checks our feelings because uh, we can really believe we feel this way. Years ago, when I was still uh, uh, up at OBU in college, a, uh, a lady came and told uh, one of the men in our shop that she was leaving him her husband, because God told her to leave him and to marry this other man who was a more godly man. And I was a kid in college, and I was like, God does not go against his word. You're, you're putting the Bible under the couch and letting, and letting your feelings, you're deciding, well, I feel like God is saying, leave my husband and marry this man. But God says, do not do that. <laughs> you can't just make up things because you feel like it. So yes, you're so right. Our feelings can deceive us terribly and make us go all kinds of directions. It's always good to keep in the Word. Jerry said that a minute ago. Read your Bible. Keep reading the Bible. Keep that truth coming in, washing over. Let it correct. It corrects us, rebukes us, trains us in righteousness. That's what the Bible does for us. God's Word is living. It's active. It's able to teach, rebuke, correct, and train us in righteousness. When we put it away, our feelings can lead us all kinds of bad directions. We can think we're doing right, feel like we're doing right, but we've missed God. This Bible has to be our foundation. Yeah. If feelings on top of that, you can deal with yeah. it. Yeah. You start with the feelings as foundation, you have to learn Right. It falls off your Yeah. And... And I've seen it said where, uh, I've seen it go the other direction. I've seen people say feelings are bad, emotions are bad. And that's going too far the other direction. God made those feelings and emotions and we should be emotional when we worship. We should be excited and we should be moved by uh, God's spirit and, and feel God's presence on us. That's a beautiful thing to experience God with our feelings and emotions, to be overwhelmed and to cry because of his presence or something he speaks to you. God gave us all that. Uh, he even gave us righteous anger. You know, he He gave us those things. So, But they they should always line up with the scriptures. If, we're, if our feelings ever are leading us away from God's word, we know we're in trouble. That's our check. All right, so sensuality, we're just going to, uh, try to go through this fairly quick. I'm not going to read every bit of this because we don't need to hear everything. But um, So he says uh, this idea uh, really is uh, taking Paul's warning against the, the flesh or living according to the flesh, the sinful nature, uh, quite literally is, is where this idea comes from. That if we set our mind on the things that the flesh desires, we, it's death. But if we set our minds on the things the Spirit desires, we have life, all right? And Paul speaks a lot about not living according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And so when, when you try to define uh, all of sin is coming from that sinful nature, you're, you've, you've left a little bit of a void. Um, he says, as appealing as this view is because of its simplicity, it nonetheless has significant shortcomings. For one thing, it seems to disregard the fact that many sins and perhaps the worst sins are not physical in nature. Kind of what we're talking about with emotions, right? In Paul's famous catalog of sins in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, where he lists out the acts of the sinful nature, many are indeed works of the flesh. In the literal sense, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, drunkenness, and orgies, those are sins of the flesh. Those are things that are very carnal, right? But listen to what else is in that list of acts of the sinful nature. It says, uh, but several are definitely spiritual in nature, not just sensual or carnal, fleshly. Uh, and those are hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Those are things in the heart, right? Now, where I think these two things aren't really, sometimes theologians miss and they, 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 they stand at two opposing areas when really there's more in common than they think. 
<laughs> but sensuality, if you're taking it literally, that it has to be something that this body takes part in, then yes, that one is very limited. But when you understand the sinful nature is a, a part of your being that craves sin. It craves all sin. What does the Bible say? Uh, God does not tempt anyone, but everyone is tempted when by their own evil desires, right? Their own evil desires. God doesn't tempt, but we, the evil and the desires inside of us. What, what is, where do those desires come from? They come from our fallen, sinful nature. Not just flesh and bone, but the sinful nature that craves. And where does jealousy come from? It comes from the sinful nature. It really does. So that is the place inside of us from which all that comes. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, uh, and I'm not saying that he's wrong here. I'm just pointing out how the sinful nature still can be the root of all of these sins. That's why he says these are the acts of the sinful nature. We're not going to go against what God just says is an act of the sinful nature, right? He says they are. But when you say that it is, it all takes place in the flesh or in the body, sensual, things like that, um, that limits it a little bit. So we're going to go to another one, another definition here. Uh, well, let me read this because it kind of has to do with what we were saying a minute ago. Uh, further rigid control of one's physical body uh, or one's physical nature does not appear to have any marked effect upon one's degree of sinfulness. Ascetics uh, attempt to bring their body. These are people who beat themselves and, you know, uh, torture themselves and don't eat, don't sleep, don't speak. They do lots of things to try to control the flesh, all right? He says uh, it really uh, doesn't appear to have any marked effect on one's degree of sinfulness. Ascetics attempt to bring their physical impulses under control and often succeed to considerable extent, yet they are not necessarily less sinful as a result. Other sins may be present, including pride. The sinful nature uh, repressed in one area simply forces expression in some other area. This is often true as, as well of older persons. While the physical passions are frequently considerably diminished, they may display great fits of irritability or impatience or something similar. Moreover, the idea that sin is essentially sensual, essentially Sensuality is a misunderstanding of flesh, according to, uh, especially as Paul uses it, the term. Uh, therefore, we must conclude that the view uh, that the view that sensuality is the essential principle of sin is inadequate. And this is so true. If you uh, let's say you 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 flog yourself every time you have a a bad thought. And so you stop having bad thoughts and you feel like, yes, I've conquered the bad thought by flogging myself and, and ripping my back up, all right? Uh, if pride comes in because you start going, boy, the rest of this world ought to be as good as I am, right? Well, all that's happened is you squash this gopher head down and another one popped up, right? And so you're not getting rid of sin. It's just appearing in a new way. And that happens to a lot of us. How many people do we know that they once, and I, 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 I've seen this so many times, and it's, I, I cringe when I see this. When a, someone comes in, they've been an alcoholic, they've been an addict, they've been in all kinds of sin and party, and they get saved, they start coming to church, they're on fire for the Lord, they're reading the Bible, they're praying, they're doing, man, they're, their life is radically changed. And they don't drink and they don't smoke and they don't cuss and they don't do drugs. They don't sleep around. They don't do any of that anymore. And all of a sudden, the sin of the devil, that's why the Bible says don't make a deacon or a preacher out of a new believer because the sin of pride is waiting to grab them. And that's exactly what I see happen a lot of times. Is someone who's new in the faith, they all of a sudden begin to look around. And they go, what's wrong with all you dead people? You're not excited about Jesus like me. I am in love with the Lord. None of y'all even like him. And there's this little lie that begins to creep in that I'm better than all of you. And I know more than all of you. And I'm closer to God than all of you. Now, can they be right that there's a lot of dead people out there in the church? Yeah, they can. 
But the problem is their heart and the judging. That's the problem. And it generally leads them to a fall, which is why I cringe every time I hear a new believer begin to condemn everybody in the church and think they are risen above everybody in the church because they're so new. Yeah. They're so new in the faith, they don't have the maturity level. Maturity comes through trials of many kinds. That's what Peter says. That's what James says. Through trials of many kinds. When you're a brand new believer, you haven't lived long enough following Christ to have gone through any trial, any suffering, any failures. You haven't yet even had the opportunity of growing in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've experienced His grace brand new, and you're excited and praise God. But you know, those are the ones that Jesus warns. They're like that soil that's just covering the rocks. And they burst up with excitement, but they have no root. And they're not able to make it through the trials and the storms that come in life. They don't develop the roots. So we never want to squash a new believer or anybody's excitement for the Lord. I always want to cheer them on. But if I begin to hear judgment and pride coming up, I want to go beside him and say, hey, don't lose your fervor and excitement for Jesus, but be very careful not to judge anybody else. The Bible says we should gently rebuke and that we should always look at ourselves first, look at the log in our own eye before we try to pick out the splinter in somebody else's. Yeah, you didn't read that verse, but that's in there. <laughs> you know, uh, judge not lest you be judged is in there. And, and should we judge one another as believers in the church? Yes, there is a... Scripture that talks about that. We have to at times, but we've got to be very careful. Hmm? Oh, yeah. He's without sin. Cast the first one, right? Yeah. So you got to have all that in you. And as a new believer, you generally you haven't read all those verses quite yet. And it's real easy. So we have to be very careful about that. Let's go now to selfishness. Let me see how am I doing. Okay, good. I can get through this one and the next one, and that will about wrap us up for the night. A second view is that sin is essentially selfishness. Now that's one that I would have been saying, it's it's about me. You know, that's what causes sin. And, and not that I don't agree that it's all from the sinful nature, but I would have said selfishness is, is definitely. All right, so he says, uh, this view is that sin is essentially selfishness. The choice of self as the supreme end, which constitutes the antith- antithesis, of supreme love to God. This view was held by Augustine Strong, or Augustus Strong, and in a somewhat different form by Reinhold Niebuhr. Niebuhr contended that pride, uh, hubris, is the major form of human opposition to God. There's good evidence for that, isn't there? Satan, his number one sin was pride, right? That's what Led to his downfall. It's what got him kicked out of heaven as he tried to say, I'm equal to God. So, yeah, sin and, and thinking of self as higher, greater than we ought to. Putting ourselves before God. Yes, this is a true definition. It is, it is very much uh, at the center of what the essence of sin is. But let's keep going. We're going to look at some, the weaknesses of this. Um, these, are, these are, by the way, very good definitions and good things to consider as the essence of what sin is. He says, according to strong selfishness, the preference of oneself to God, preferring oneself over God, may reveal itself in many forms. If in, in someone with inordinate appetites or desires, it takes the form of sensuality. Selfishness may also appear as unbelief, turning away from the truth of God. Or it may be manifested, manifested as enmity to God. If we conceive of God's holiness as resisting and punishing us, then we would see him as an enemy because we're putting ourselves before him. And God's my enemy. He's, he's disciplining me, so I'm mad at him. I mean, think about little children. Sometimes they get mad at mom or dad when they get disciplined, right? They don't understand. And so now mom and dad, who's doing something loving, is their enemy. So why is that? Because they believe that they're right and mom and dad are wrong. <laughs> That's why they are, it's selfishness, it's self-centeredness. They have a higher view of themselves and they're not submitted to mom and dad. So he goes on and says, thus sin is uh, whatever form, in whatever form is selfishness. 
It is uh, preferring one's own ideas to God's truth. It is preferring the satisfaction of one's own will to doing God's will. It is loving oneself more than God, dethronement of God from his rightful place as the Lord of one's life requires enthroning something else. And this is understood to be the enthronement of oneself. You can't have two kings on the throne. If I'm on the throne of my life, Jesus cannot be. If I'm the Lord of my life, which means I obey my will, I do what I want, then I cannot possibly be doing his will and obeying his commands. And so that's why selfishness is so dangerous to us and why it certainly leads to much of the sins that we commit. Um, we hate, we are greedy, we lie. Most of the time, those revolve around us and what we're wanting. We either want to manipulate something for us. We're lying to get ourselves out of trouble. We're lying to get something that we think we deserve. We're greedy. We cheat. We steal. All of those things are because of us. It's a it's a sin, sinful nature. It's about me. Like and, child, uh, when, um, the child, a child is the center of their own universe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We are born selfish, and part of that is survival. Because if you don't yell loud, nobody feeds you, and if you don't yell loud, you you lay there in a messy diaper. So. Exactly. So selfishness is kind of, you know, God uses that sinful nature. But we come out wanting the toy to be ours. And nobody has to teach us how to fight with another kid for the toy. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. We, we come out of the womb wanting it, grabbing cookies out of other kids' hands. Nobody has to teach us that stuff. That's selfishness. That's self-centeredness. It's there from the start. And it comes from the sinful nature. So already our first two definitions are kind of could merge together, that they they work hand in hand. It's a part of our sinful nature. But let's look at our last one. It's called displacement of God. He says an alternative uh, preferable to the views that sin is basically sensuality or basically selfishness is that the essence of sin is simply failure to let God be God. What is the essence of sin? This definition says that the essence of sin is not letting God be God. And that that in itself leads to all other sins. And he's going to explain why. And he, it's a very good point. It is placing something else, anything else, in the supreme place which is his. Thus, choosing oneself rather than God is not wrong because self is chosen, but because something other than God is chosen. So the, the sin or the wrong is not because you were selfish, but because you didn't keep God in God's place. You put yourself in God's place is what they're emphasizing. He goes on and says, uh, choosing any finite object over God is wrong, no matter how selfless such an act might be. And we can do selfless acts uh, and still put those selfless acts uh, in place of God. So just like we looked at sensuality and we looked at how things are not always like literally flesh, um, but things are in the heart, jealousy, anger, hate, those things. We also can look at selfishness and say, well, there's times that we can sin and it's not selfishness. What if someone gives their life to follow Buddha? or Hinduism, or flies a plane into a building for Allah. That's a selfless act. They have given themselves to a false god. That's sin, but it's not sin rooted in selfishness. Now, can there be a case that somebody says, I want the 600 virgins I get when I die, so I'm going to fly? Well, okay, then there's selfishness involved. But a lot of times, people are truly devoted to their god or their faith, and they will give things that even hurt them, that cause them pain and sacrifice. And if we say that every time we do something like that because of a reward that we're promised, it's always selfishness, then that would even begin to apply to us as Christians. Because do we do what we do only for the reward, which is selfishness, or we do it because we love God and we want to obey Him and we want His name to be glorified? 
So even in Christianity, we have to be careful to not let selfishness be driving why we do what we do. Think about this. Some people use in the health and wealth gospel world, some people um, give generously to the televangelist because he says their house will be paid for. Their house will be paid off, right? Some people give $1,000 because the preacher said uh, your sick friend will be healed if you'll just send a gift. God will respond to it. So now maybe in a friend case, it's not selfish. But if I want, if I want my house paid for and you told me I can give you $1,000 and my house is going to be paid off this month, that's me. <laughs> I'm not giving for the kingdom. I'm giving to get a house paid for. You know. And if you tell me that if I'll just keep giving generously, someday I'm going to have a few jets and six homes in different countries, what am I living for? Materialism. I want the houses Kenneth Copeland has. I want all the jets. You know, I want everything. So I'm going to give to get. That's that's gambling or the stock market. That's not faith. <laughs> exactly. So. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's a strong teaching that's out there, and there's a lot of Bible verses that get used to support it. And it's understanding that the Bible definitely says, as you sow, you will reap, and that God does desire to bless us. Second Timothy says he desires to give us everything for our enjoyment. we got a lot of great verses that show that God loves us. For the apple of his eye, we can point to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon. There's plenty of rich people, uh, Queen Esther, and so on and so on and so on, people who are poverty-stricken. Uh, Joseph, second to the Pharaoh, and given tremendous power and authority. Mordecai, we could name many, many people that God took from this and put them over much, gave them much power, much wealth, and so on. But we can also... Go ahead, Arlene. Exactly, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, anyone you see who's really mature in the Christian faith, they've gone through suffering. They've gone through trial. And you may not know everything they've walked through, but they have gone through things. They've, they've had crossroads in their faith. They've had challenges. They've had to face battles in their mind and hard. And uh, some have lost, some have had health issues, lost loved ones, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but you don't arrive at maturity in the faith as a believer, without having gone through trials and suffering. And, uh, there are people among us, by the way, they're not solid and rich. Right. But God has blessed them immensely because of what they do, not because of themselves, but because of what they do. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Yes, we do. And that's the thing. They is, don't know who they are. Right. <laughs> yeah. We've got people that, God, in the Bible, we've got people that are rich and that God made rich and He gave it to them and then they He, he gave it to them for them to use in, in good ways, and, and, and many of them did. We also, Daniel was a man who was way up in power, but he was a righteous man. He never stopped praying. But you can also find in the Bible where Jesus says to a fellow, I think it's in Luke 9, uh, these fellows come up and say, we want to follow you. He says, do you know that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? Are you ready to do that? And the man says, well, let me first go home and, 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 and bury my, my, my father. And he says, uh, let the dead bury the dead. There's, there's this idea that Jesus is saying, look, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. It means death. It means suffering. It doesn't mean this life of lush and lavish things and that everybody who follows God gets to be rich and comfortable. In fact, that is not what we see. We can look at the prophets. John the Baptist was a poor man who ate locusts and wild honey. And he lived his whole life devoted to God. Elijah and John the Baptist dressed the exact same way and lived very similar lives. And Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah who had come back. Right? Which was a fulfillment of prophecy. Job reminds me of what you're talking about. Yeah. Job lost... Right. But he had favor in God's eyes. God was allowing him to lose that because he was taking him someplace higher in his spiritual walk. So we, we've got people right now, uh, people around the world who serve on mission fields who are very, very poor, 
They've given everything up to follow Christ, to preach the gospel in a poor nation instead of living in a rich nation and living with luxuries. They've given their life and followed his call and they've gone and they've given everything up. Now, are they lesser of a believer? Do they have less faith? And that's where, because I'm like you, there was a time that I, I had to wrestle with those things that I was hearing on TV. In my college years, I'm like, well, I see those verses and I do believe that God blesses people. And I do know from my own life, I've given and I've seen God give back far more. I've never been able to outgive God. I've learned that being generous to the things of God is always better. I love watching how he provides for me. So I know those verses are true. But it's the place where it gets taken to and then the declaration that this is for everybody, that that's where it goes astray because we can name many, many who served God and were never made rich, but their life was a calling to serve God out of the little, out of the nothing. Paul the Apostle, golly gee, that man was beaten, imprisoned, stoned, left for dead, and kept right on serving. And he could have lived a life of comfort, but he gave it all up for Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was times, he said, I've learned contentness, whether I had a lot or little. Because there was times that people would send money and, and support the work he was doing. And he was able to even give money to help others go on mission work. But it was just, he was a vessel that was flowing through. He wasn't a man who walked around flouting the money, living high. No, he was in prison all the time. But when he was in Rome, he was sending missionaries out. And they literally, he was under house arrest and he had to pay for his own living quarters. And how did he do that? Except that people were sending money, and it was the grace of God that he did that. And then he, and what did he do? He didn't begin to live in luxury. He was sending out ministers into all the provinces of Asia, sending them out with those letters that he was writing. So it's a very different understanding of when God gives us money, what are we to do with it? And it doesn't mean that we, we can't necessarily have some nice things. We can find many people in Scripture, even in the New Testament, that have uh, nice things but serve the Lord. Um, Joseph of Arimathea was a very rich man. Nicodemus was, and there was many others. Uh, Lydia, the seller of purple cloth. If you sold purple cloth, you were a wealthy woman. There's many rich people who began to be followers of Christ, and they helped support the work out of their wealth. And it's how Jesus and the apostles did so much. So we are called, and God blesses and provides and gives more wealth so we can give it away and help. And he loves us being good stewards with his money. And that's the thing to never forget. It's his money. If you've got millions, you've got millions of his dollars. If you've got ten bucks, you've got ten dollars. It's his ten dollars. <laughs> that's when you're in trouble, isn't that right? Yep. Amen. Well, let me finish up reading this little part, and uh, it says this contention is supported by major texts in both the Old and New Testament. The Ten Commandments begin with the command to give God His proper place. So remember, we're talking about. Uh, the essence of sin being the displacement of God, putting anything in place of God, that any finite object over God is wrong. So he's saying this is supported heavily by major texts in the Old and the New Testament. And so uh, one of them that we can look up is Exodus 20, verse 3. It's a famous one um, right there in the Ten Commandments. Can't go a whole night in theology class without opening our Bibles, right? I've been quoting lots of scriptures for you, but we'll. Verse three. Yep. Exodus. Yep. <laughs> it's all right. Happens every week to somebody. <laughs> Yes. No other gods before him. Don't displace God. It's one of the big Ten Commandments, right? Um, we're also called, and we can look at a, a New Testament verse, Mark 12, 30. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like to preach on that one a lot. <laughs> Would uh, somebody like to read that one? I'll read it. Okay. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. 
in man. So he's quoting the Old Testament, right? He's quoting how we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then, And that, that is the first and the greatest commandment. If we love God, think about it. I've meditated on this a lot in the last couple of years. And it, it, God really spoke this verse to me in a big, big way that if I love God with all of my heart, how can I love anything else more than him? And if I love him with all of my heart and all of my mind and all of my soul and with all of my strength, I can't be sinning, right? Because I am, I'm, 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 there's nothing displacing him. Where we mess up is when we don't obey that command. That's when sin comes into our life. When we don't love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. So any time that I allow maybe some entertainment in my life that I know isn't right, but I say, it's not that bad. Any time that I do something like that, I've, I've said, I'm going to displace this total love with all of my heart, and I'm going to love this just a little. Even though I know it's not all the way right. That's that sinful nature. It's displacing Anytime that I begin to think more highly of myself, I, I, I've done something, and instead of keeping quiet about it, I tell somebody. I've, I've taken away God getting the glory and the praise because I wanted it. And I just displaced my heart loving God with, with all of my heart. I, I've loved me. So there's maybe I love him with 60, 80, 90% of my heart on that day, but there's a little part of it that was loving me. And that little part that was loving me jumped up and took some of his glory, which is not a loving act, right? So I love this definition, displacement of God. I think all three are very strong and they are biblically based. But honestly, this one here can, like umbrella, encompass sensuality and selfishness. Because selfishness, if you're displacing God, it's because you're selfish, right? And um, Or if you're selfish, it's because you've displaced God. You put something else in front of him. And it just really comes back to if the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is the second, right? If all of it it does. It exactly. Yep. Because you can't hate, you can't lie, you can't steal, you can't commit adultery, you can't commit murder, you can't do any of those things if you love him. Because why he said if you don't love people, you can't say you love me. That's First John, right? We have to love one another, even our enemies, he says. Even Jeremy. Well, <laughs> rather, Jeremy has to love me, even if my axe handle flies off and grazes his head. He still has to love me. <laughs> right, do you all have any comments, anything you want to add to our discussion?